So um, the uh, I, th I think that actually segs nicely into the few summary slides we put together. Um, you know, I think Rex said nicely and, and, and George sort of talking about our work in phenotyping and really starting with that research grade and multimodal approach over longitudinal records. Um, and uh, uh, Rex reviewed the number of phenotypes um, that we've proposed in different uh, networks. But it's interesting, when you look at VKB, about half the phenotypes are emerged. That shows other networks are using it, which is great. Um, but, uh, uh, but these 75 are mostly what's happened in one and two. Most of these 27 actually aren't on there yet. So it's a superset and a subset. So it, it just highlights that we're doing a lot of things that aren't, aren't actually captured. And these are all validated phenotypes. And, and, and most are multi-site validated phenotypes, um, which shows that transportability question. Um, we've talked a lot, both Kevin, um, Ken, sorry, and, um, and George about uh, some common data models, um, standards that can be uh, hopefully accelerate the process. I think we're actually moving there and we're creating this common variable dictionary that helps us, you know, uh, simplify the covariate process a lot um, and allows, you know, some, you know, sort of the question of how much work do you need to do to get a good phenotype and, 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 and participate in, you know, huge um, meta-analyses, for instance, we can actually turn a lot of those around really quickly now because we have standard high-level phenotypes. But, um, and, and then we talked a little bit about machine learning and that idea of accelerating and some of the tensions there. Marilyn highlighted nicely, I thought, the idea of um, uh, that tension and exploration of new kinds of things. I wanted to just um, uh, show a few slides of, of examples of things that, that hits on things. It's all, uh, not a few slides, one slide. Um, uh, so this is the stuff in um, VKB, and you can see amongst the, the 154 phenotypes that you know most of them are using billing codes, but a lot of them, you know, 42% are using some sort of text mining, and I, I think that relates to stuff like this. So we've done a lot of innovative kinds of phenotypes that highlight the EHR, and I think you know a lot of us would say we don't want to lose that in the next round to say we do 200 phenotypes that are maybe not so interesting. We'd rather continue to do things like. You know, this is uh, major adverse cardiovascular events on statins, and we have a locus which predicts, you know, failure of statins um, independent of the LDL effect of statins um, that could be a drug target. And so that may have a real, you know, real impact. Um, and, um, you know, uh, phenomod um, studies were uh, highlighted by Rex. And so, you know, maybe you could say that's 1,800 phenotypes we're looking at. It works out surprisingly well. We tend not to talk about it as, a phen as, as the phenotypes because we can now just, you know, push, push a click of a button and have a, a module that does that. And then we have the ability to do other kinds of things, like the work that Columbia and we're doing on clustering phenotypes, and and we've you know there's been other types of projects like this um, uh, where we can look at you know disease patterns that occur in um, uh, that that we don't see otherwise, and you really can't do that without the dense longitudinal um, record. And so um, just kind of uh, uh, highlighting that trade-off between you know the complicated phenotype versus the simpler ones, and where do we think the greatest value for emerge would be? And I think you know in generally we've been pursuing those more complicated because they tend to be more sci scientifically interesting. Um, uh, we do use a lot of multimodal phenotypes, and none of the current sort of quality standards support NLP. Um, we can do great stuff with simpler methods, and we want to continue to accelerate that, as Richard pointed out. Um, uh, we have uh, a lot of um, uh, phenotype innovation uh, across different um, degrees. Um, in addition to what I said before, um, optical character recognition that Marshfield pursued, a lot of portable NLP modules um, implemented in NIME and other um, sorts of resources, deeper phenotyping. I think this ability to go back to the patient um, uh, is something that we're sort of seeing in Emerge 3 and some of the Emerge 2 work that is an extension that we've talked about, um, both in deeper medical record dives as well as the patient itself. And then um, I think we're seeing different kinds of phenotypes emerge, uh, no pun intended, um, with the sequencing um, data. Um, and so that, that's, th those are the, the summary things we came up with. Marilyn, do you want to add anything? Two minutes left before the session ends. Are there any other questions? Rex. I, I just might uh, comment on what Josh said. Um, you know, as we think about the trade-off versus easy versus hard or complex phenotypes, you know, one of the things we might want to consider is phenotypes that have the greatest impact on health. Yeah, I think it would be a great idea to set some priorities. But I also, I also just want to inject, interject the notion that um, you know, in some of these phenotypes, um, it's, it's, it, it, when, when we start working across, across these systems, it's, 
it's not, it may not be enough to have one definition of a, of a phenotype because the, it's really dependent. We talked about three different um, uh, users of diabetes. We have a handful of different definitions of diabetes. There's not one definition of diabetes, and that's we're done with that phenotype. Because if you want to do a GWAS, it's going to be highly specific. If you want to do a quality assurance thing, you want to see who's getting their flu shots, that might not represent, that might be, represent extreme cases. If you want to know prevalence of disease, then it, just taking the ones with definite disease against those that definite might not give you the right number. So you actually need to have built into your, your machine that spits out diabetes the option to dial it up and dial it down depending on what the investigator really wants to, the question that the investigator really wants to answer. Mm -hmm. Harry? Could I just, just one comment? Okay. Yeah, um, in, in terms of other things to focus on, if we could try to focus on things that are sort of genomic-y, that would be nice too, um, since we are in this room. Everything's genomics, Terry. So one, one thing that Ken, um, um, there's a thread that I wanted to pull on from that um, Ken mentioned. I, I'm and this is, uh, if you're going to sustain this thing, make it so that endpoints that everybody cares about also are useful for academics. And you mentioned in the context of who, there was tons of money being spent on quality control and cleaning phenotypes. Make it so that this effort is useful to those people, because then they'll spend that money on you. And, and uh, each institution has their own examples. But it could be a real uh, win, because it's 20, 30x the amount of money that's being spent on eMERGE. Mm -hmm. All right, we are right at 11.15. Thank you very much.